What's up, good people? Welcome back to the 950 Club Anime Podcast. I'm Jamal. You've heard my voice before on the After Hours specials, and I am here today to present to you the one-year anniversary special of the podcast. In what will be a two-part anniversary special, we are paying homage to one of the OGs of the anime space. It's been a major influence in the genre and is special to all of us fans, Studio Ghibli. Now, this episode originally dropped wherever you listen to podcasts on our anniversary on September 7th. But in honor of the grand opening of Ghibli Park in Japan, we're dropping the episode on YouTube with a brand new epilogue today on November 1st, 2022. In part one of the celebration, Edwin and Jack dive into one of Edwin's all time favorite films, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind. Sit back and enjoy the discussion of an all-time classic, and if you get a chance to travel, check out the brand new Ghibli Park. I'll catch you on the other side. But, just for Jack and Edwin, I recorded this like a thousand times, and this is why I always freestyle on the show. No notes. Hi, I'm Edwin. And I am Jack, and welcome back. To the 950 Club. Happy one year anniversary! Woo! Woohoo! Hi, and welcome to our anniversary special. That's right, we've been doing the 950 Club for a year now. <sighs> Time flies. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> Time does fly. I can't believe that it's been a year, Jack. Uh, we have talked about so many different and awesome anime. Yeah, and it was like one of those starting blocks because I initially our ethos is talking about anime that it's not really talked about. Little by little, me and Edwin and Jamal and Martin have opened our closets. We were... Now we're talking about some of our favorites, and we're, it's like The Wizard of Oz. Sometimes you're going to see The Wizard. Eventually, you're going to see The Wizard. Yeah. <laughs> Pull back the curtain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that, you know, that there was this, we had been watching uh, anime throughout the entire pandemic, and there was so much anime that I had watched that I'm like, oh, my God, I need to talk to this. I need to talk to somebody about this. Yeah, yeah. And I reached out to Jack, and I said, hey, Jack, I want to do an anime podcast. And Jack was like, this is happening. Yeah, yeah. It, it became so, emotion right off the bat because I got a degree, or not a degree, but a certificate in audio uh, engineering stuff, and I need practice, and this is a perfect ultimation. Yeah, Jack has done an amazing job with the editing on every single episode of the 950 Club. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I try, I try. Yeah, he's also been the force behind our social media presence. Thank you, Jack. I try with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not good with Twitter. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, is anybody? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've been, I think you've done an amazing job on IG, uh, and Facebook, uh, keeping people up to date on what we're doing and bringing them this amazing artwork from so many talented people. I, I can't help it. It's for, part of our passions and stuff. And of course, with, uh, of course, my partner ahead of me with Edwin, pretty much being the anchor, getting these things, you know, make sensical, you know, I'm always out there. I'm more of the collar commentary. Edwin's needs to get the motions going and he does the uh episode cover art and it's it's on my all-time favorites i love it to pieces jack, well that I, I blame jack entirely <laughs> for that because he from the beginning he wanted me to he he knows that i dabbled you know in drawing and uh i enjoyed to draw it was my, my a little hobby that i had and he pushed me uh him and other people pushed me and pushed me and pushed me to the point where I'm now producing uh, covers that I'm proud of yeah, and actually proud to show people. <laughs> no, and you upgraded too with the digital art. Like that's still like, I'm still on paper myself. Like I don't even know if I crossed that boundary yet. Um, digital art, um, 
A shout out to my cousin Coffrey. Yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, he's a good guy, and he would not leave me alone until uh, I invested in um, some digital art equipment. And uh, I have to thank him because, oh my God, it made such a difference. And it's been so much fun learning that process. And it's helped my art grow so much. And the 950 Club has benefited from that with some amazing covers. I love the cover that I did for um, our Dragon special. Yeah, that was great. That was oh, great. man. Yeah. Toro and Letty, uh, it came out so well. Uh, all of that was done digitally. Uh, and I, I was really, really happy with it. Yeah. And also with a tie in with our one year anniversary, like I said, we're opening up the curtain more and more Edwin mentioning his artwork and, uh, let's just say Ghibli was pretty much like the starting force for your early days of drawing comics. Yes, it was. Um, so we have to go back way, way, way back. And we have to go back to the eighties and we have to go across the ocean to uh, Japan, where uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Suzuki uh, was tasked with the, the job of creating a new anime magazine uh, called Animage. Yeah. Uh, so what I've heard is, I, so there's com- I've seen some conflicting stories as to whether or not uh, the beginning of it was a lot harder than... Uh, so there's some conflicting stories. Oh, so, yeah. It's, it's a still an ongoing oh, yeah. history. It really is. So one of them is that his – so essentially his editor said, you have like a week to set up this magazine. And he's like, I don't know anything about animation. Yeah, yeah. And so he – you know, he's like, what am I going to do? And so one of the things he does is he reaches out to Miyazaki to do an interview for the magazine. And Miyazaki's like, no. Yeah. And so Suzuki's like, what? Yeah, Miyazaki's like, just no, I'm not doing that. And so Suzuki's like, all right, I'm going to keep at this. So he keeps at it. He gets not he gets Miyazaki to do the interview. So th- they kind of get along because at a, a, at a certain point they are talking and Miyazaki, Suzuki essentially wants Miyazaki to do Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which is uh, something that Miyazaki has been, you know, working on for a little bit not not a manga not anything but just an idea yeah a general yeah. idea for something so suzuki's like we need to do this and they're they're both like okay the especially the editor the editor was like uh, yeah and let's do this the the editor of that is hideo ogata and he was pretty much one on the other side besides suzuki they wanted to get this information he was the one that is actually pushing uh miyazaki to do this because miyazaki at this point has kind of like done his own thing he wasn't even born into uh animation as it is no but he started working in animation with um takahara yes yes um like right out of college yeah uh which is kind of bizarre after two degrees in politics and uh nature uh, environmentalism yeah <laughs> it, did, did, it's beyond fascinating yeah it's like how do you end up in animation yeah um and so he had worked on a lot of projects before he'd been director on i believe the lupin movie yes yes and, and uh kind of cast the tv oh i can't pronounce it the castle the castle of castiglio that's the one yeah uh, so he'd been a director on that. And so this was going to be his next directorial uh, production. Yeah. And um, none of the studios wanted it. They were like, no. <laughs> because, and this is really fascinating. This is one of the fascinating things that learning that as like today, the studios want something that has a fan base built around it. And usually that means that it has a manga following. So even back then in the 80s, they were looking to do projects based on manga. And Miyazaki had, he himself had said that there was too much anime and too much manga. And, and he, he has worked in the field before with uh, Tohei Animation. Yeah. And uh, he worked on Lupin the Third, Heidi, you know, these really cool, like, early like early days of anime production and distribution. Yeah, Anne of Green Gables. Yeah, Anne of Green Gables, one of his most revered. And Takata was in that, too. Well, he, he felt that Takata's best was uh, Heidi. Yes, yes. <laughs> He kept the goats from the museum <laughs> exposition. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, Takata, if you if you want to know the full the full name Isayo Takata, is pretty much the ultimate 
anime director as well. He's the one who did Grave of the Fireflies mm-hmm. and Tale of Princess Kaguya. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty much like the same directory as uh, Miyazaki. And the assumption, a lot of people think of this over uh, with Ghibli, with Miyazaki. Miyazaki is the one that did all this on his own. Pretty much like Walt Disney. Like he had an idea since day one. Quite the opposite. No. So what they did was uh, since. Uh, Suzuki was working on anime. He said he told Miyazaki, "Well, we'll do the manga. Do the manga. Yeah, we'll put it in the magazine." And it became the most popular manga ever for the magazine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was produced. Uh, he did several, and he kept on like drawing it well into the nineties. Yeah, yeah. Like I have a beautiful. Jack's gonna post a picture of this on uh, <sighs> Instagram. I want it. <laughs> It's not it's not a wallet slayer, so no, you should no. you should do yourself a favor and get it. I know. Uh, but this beautiful two volume set of like the entire series, and the artwork's just amazing, and I love the idea because you don't see that here too much where you have a magazine that has weekly or monthly comics. Yeah, yeah. And you can go and say, hey, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna read this. That's usually for comics itself it's not you don't usually have a magazine that has like small little snippets yeah yeah. so they did the magazine and the you know the, it did well uh the manga did well and it generated an audience so that in um 83 uh they started producing the movie um and so what happened was that new world released it here in the states it had done really really well in japan and they came out with a deal to uh, New World would produce it, uh, would produce the the English dub, the English sub, sorry, here in the states, and it went horribly wrong. Yeah, and also the manga wasn't completed initially, and like Edwin was saying, the manga is officially done through the '90s because this is a big, big grand epic, almost like Akira. And uh, basically, during this whole process in the mid '80s. Uh, the studio, studio was well, had to be information. We get, we gotta get this out. This would be great as a film. Well, the the movie itself had he had finished the narrative for the movie. Yes, yes. Uh, watching that process unfold, I I don't know. I don't think any other studio works that way. No, no. And it's yeah. it's a case study. And there's two documentaries on it. There's yeah. lots and lots of like tidbits. And it's just like, watching his creative process. The man was allowed to dream, daydream like a child. Yeah, I mean it's it's awesome and terrifying yeah. at the same time. And we're talking about like the greatest, pretty much almost the greatest assembly of like animators. We're talking about influences from Golden Shell, Neon Genesis, uh, uh, Fist of North, North Star. All these creators were in that same process making Nausicaa. Well, because, and it's very ironic where he complained. I read in um, his starting point. Uh, the collected like writings yeah. and interviews of the basis of our of episodes. Miyazaki. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was so upset. He he felt that there was too much anime, and yet his studio birthed like a new generation of you know super talented people yeah. that went on to create anime that influenced even more anime. Yeah, and we're so, it's similar to, like Stanley Kubrick assembling an Avengers team of like uh, the George Lucas, Steven Spielberg. Yeah. You name it, Francis Ford Coppola. Like, imagine that. That's literally what happened in this cultivation. Yeah, he kind of like birthed influences that would ensure that there would be anime and manga for decades to come. Yeah. And they didn't have a cent. They were f- no. fuming with money with this. No, this production was you know by the seat of their pants. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe I watched one uh, YouTube documentary, and I can't remember because I couldn't find it before. I watched this before quite some time ago but it had mentioned that they had people from an accounting firm <laughs> helping them with some of the animation because they just didn't have they needed dollars and cents yeah, yeah. uh takahara said what are you doing to miyazaki what are you doing to him look at the pressure that you're yeah, putting him yeah. under he, he was surprised only a buffer piece at one point yeah, yeah he 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 stood up for him yeah uh, even though that later on in life they became like more rivals yeah. they were always friends but i think the rivalry and the competition kind of took over. The, the, and the philosophies, uh, I always compare it to like the added job, uh, too many chefs in the kitchen. It's two geniuses in the same building, the same neighborhood, in the same planet. They needed to be separated. Yeah, they yeah. both had their way of doing things. Yep, yep. And it was not similar. Yep, yep. Yeah, they're watching Miyazaki work on The Wind Rises. 
I would have pulled my hair out. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how these people didn't have ulcers because, and he talks about this in starting points. He didn't believe in scenarios. Yeah. And yeah. Th- this is a man that's set in his ways, but of a time of Japan. We're talking about post-war, World War II, very practical. And anime was definitely of his. Well, for him, he felt. And, and what I mean by a scenario is I mean a script. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, what, that's what I was trying to get at, too. Yeah, essentially, like, you know, um, a written plan for what was going to happen in the out, film. Out the window. Yeah, no, he did everything with storyboards. Yeah, literally storyboards. And we're talking about, like, really detailed, almost like at an exhibition type of storyboards. Well, yeah, I mean, you bought me that Nausicaa yeah. uh, book. Uh, Pretty much like a, spark, a, star, a starting flame for this uh, podcast episode. Yeah. 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 Uh, You bought me that beautifully, uh, it's a collection of the paintings that, uh, the painting and some of the artwork that Miyazaki did for Nausicaa, and it's absolutely gorgeous, it's beautiful, but these storyboards are like mini paintings. He didn't just, it's just not, it's not just fleshing out the action, you know, it's fleshing out the scenery, it's fleshing out the back, essentially it's, 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 he's creating a movie not shot per shot, but like scene per scene. Yeah. He has a detailed painting of what he wants to happen in that scene. And it's that's an insane process. Extremely. And he's yeah. more of the animation side of things, ironically. It took him until he got older, of course, that he became more fascinated with backgrounds. Just having that talent starting off with the backgrounds is beyond a scope of things for me, at least. Yeah. yeah. You could tell how it evolved throughout the watching the movies. Yeah. 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 It's in the starting point, of course, with Nausicaa for the yeah. first ever official Ghibli production. It wasn't even a Ghibli production yeah, um, uh, to- at the time. I think it was through Toei at one point. Well, they had left Toei. Both oh, okay. Takahara. They left, yeah. yeah, they both left Toei. They left Toei after, I believe, uh, there was a movie called Horus. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was wondering what it the missing had, link was. It yeah. had kind of flopped. Yeah. Uh, and so they both left Toei. Yeah, they Nausicaa got produced under another studio, but at the same time, it was kind of like it was kind of like a guerrilla production. Yeah, yeah. Because they were doing all this pretty much on their own, uh, and that's why Takahara was like, "What are you doing to Miyazaki?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think that they ever put Miyazaki under that kind of pressure again. Uh, it doesn't seem like. Well, it's definitely the, a baby steps because during the distribution and process afterwards too. Yeah, for like that's when Miyazaki became like George Lucas. I'm just doing this my way afterwards. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can understand that yeah. after after the sleepless nights and the stress. Oh, yeah. um, and he he has a hard time sleeping as it is. So it got it got made. It was released in Japan. It did really amazingly well. Uh, so like I said, New World picked up in the United States, but they wanted to market it for children. They wanted to market they wanted to market it to children, so they edited out like half an hour of the film, removed the intro, uh, changed the name to Warriors of the Wind. <laughs> so all of this was happening. I was about nine, I think, yeah, I was about nine years old. I had already seen like Transformers and Voltron and Transor Z. Uh, I might have seen a little bit of Robotech at the time. Yeah, and those are like your early like introductions towards anime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Without even realizing yep. uh, that it was from Japan. Uh, and so I would go to my grandparents' house a lot to visit them and stay over. My aunt, she had bought um, a VCS. A VC, uh a VCS. <laughs> a VCR. Oh. Uh, they were, back then, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were new. Um, it was, you know, it was toward the, it was 1984. So it was still kind of not in the mid eighties. Uh, and so when they released uh, Nausicaa here in the States, they released it as Warriors of the Wind. Yes. And it was bad. But you were still fascinated by it. Well, I was fascinated by, well, looking back on it, like it's hard to find, um, you can't unless you have the VHS. Yeah, it's hard original. to find the, because Miyazaki yeah. pretty much blocked it. Well, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> because I mean, but I'm curious. I'm very curious to watch it myself. A lot of people talk about the poster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where um, it looks like a like a GI Joe special. It looks really bad. Yeah, it, it looks really bad. Um, and but for me, watching even though they had butchered it so bad, I think Miyazaki's his energy. And that that just like 
what is this? Yeah. That that curiosity that it was so different from anything that I watched here. Yeah. Even even after watching Transformers and Robotech, I mean, it was just so the the excitement and uh, Nausicaa's passion. That's those things still got through. At least the, the idea or, of the toxic jungle. Yeah. Those things, those ideas got through even though New World had butchered it so badly. They focus more on the action and adventure. Well, they did that, but it still, those elements still got through. Yeah, yeah. And man, it blew my mind. It was the first thing, like I had, I, w- I was an avid comic book reader too. I read G.I. Joe. I read the X-Men. I read back then, you know, uh, Transformers, some Spider-Man, some Captain America, uh, you know, some a lot of Marvel and none of that had ever kind of driven me to draw comics. Uh, but Warriors of the Wind, you know, Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, that did. Yeah, yeah. That did. I was drawing, like, you know, the further adventures of Nausicaa. I was doing my own comics, you know, set in the toxic jungle. I was incorporating myself and some of my relatives in there. And it was amazing because nothing had ever spoken to me that way. Yeah, yeah. And Nausicaa did. Uh, and as it moved on through the years, uh, they did a, um, well, Miyazaki made a deal where he had the rights to the movies. It's like, that. that's it. He had the right to final edit. He knew right off the bat, like, from our hero now, if I'm ever going to have another project up ahead, it's got to be my way. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it, it, after that, I mean, that was, it was butchered so I bad. I don't blame him. It's, it's yeah. like, it's like uh, Quentin Tarantino sending in Pulp Fiction and like Miramax doing like a crazier, like romantic comedy. <laughs> Just imagine that. I can see that. John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> the romantic comedy you never knew you ever wanted. <laughs> it's that. It's pretty much like that. And yeah, yeah, I don't blame him one bit. That's essentially what that's was essentially what happened with uh, Nausicaa, What they did to it, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was released. They did a much better um, sub or a dub. Sorry, dub dub sub. If I'm not they, they yeah. did a, a much better dub uh, in the early '90s. Yeah, uh, with Patrick Stewart, I, I believe Uma Thurman. Uh, and Allison Lohman. Yeah, and I was, and even uh, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, makes an appearance, yeah. which I thought was really weird. No, like uh, if I'm not mistaken, that dub version uh, came out in mid 2000s because Shia LaBeouf. That's what threw me off because uh, Allison Lohman. Oh yeah, she was relatively young if she would have done around that time, and I really like her. You're right. I think it was the 90s. They, yeah. they, a lot of people. There's a lot of. There's a lot of confusion. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get because Warriors of the Wind, you saw it in English, right? Initially? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And do you remember Patrick Stewart's voice? That's no. A, okay. He was not in the original. That's he what was, I thought. Yeah. He was in the, the it, it came out, I believe, in the 90s. Yeah. Or maybe I'll have to, we'll have to do, we'll have to look it up, Jack. Yeah. It's still yeah. added on because uh, I remember you mentioned that too. I'm like, wait a second. Shia LaBeouf. Why is Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> yeah. Back in the, yeah. He would have been like, that would have been like when, like, uh, maybe he might have been a baby. I don't yeah, know. yeah. No, no. It's it's one of those scenes where, um, yeah, the English dub the revenge took gears because it was that much of a hassle to to get these redubs, even for Castle in the Sky, even for my neighbor Tortoro. Like Miyazaki came around to it after Spirit of the Way. So it was like one of those like distribution things because it has to be his way from here on out, and pretty much was exclusive for Japan, but. From hearing other people being introduced to Ghibli, a lot of people got into Totoro. A lot of people got into uh, Before Spirit Away, essentially. And I was oh, Totoro was huge. Yeah, yeah. Totoro was huge. Yeah, like all the girls I knew loved, even to this day, they they love my neighbor Totoro. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, especially when you're young, it's perfect uh, kitty film. Perfect yeah. one. And that bunch. that's what Miyazaki wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I I think there are a few movies where. He kind of like gets away w- gets away from that. Like yeah. uh, Nausicaa is definitely one of them. Yeah, I think that um, Porco Rosso is another one of them, and I think The Wind Rises. I think these are. I think those three are more personal movies for him. Oh yeah, yeah, much more. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of like fascinating how Nausicaa pretty much like because of all the wrongs became more of the right. Yeah, yeah, and. Going back to our first episode, literally our first podcast episode, the first anime we reviewed is Keep Your Hands Off Isaac in. Which, after watching the documentaries on Miyazaki, 
I appreciate that show so much. That's more. what I was trying to get at. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, their struggles and their desires and what they were trying to do and just trying to watch the trying to recreate those movements from reality yes. in film. Yes. That that was very cool yeah. to see that I don't know if it had been modeled after Miyazaki. I would say but so. But that that yeah, that idea of like this is somebody who wants to be in animation but you're not really sure that they want to make yeah. films. And that's the yeah. ethos of Ezekin because the three different girls, one's a dreamer, one's the technical, like mm-hmm. I'm doing everything. And then one's, one's the producer. producer. Yeah. And and there are three girls. That's also also a very key thing because uh, Ghibli, of course, is very like stark on its progression with lead female protagonist. And, uh, you know, these three girls being the opposite side, like, let's do a studio. Like, they initially, pretty much the plot of the story is that these three girls want to do an anime studio, but the school wants them to only do film. So they have to do these projects. Well, it was because they already had an, an anime club. Yeah, yeah. And so the, these these women, they wanted to do their own anime, but they didn't want to do it through the anime club. Yes. And so then they started a film club. And... The school's like, well, what's the difference? <laughs> and they're like, what? You don't understand? This is animation. But they're actually doing it, too. Yeah. That's the key thing, too. Yeah, we're creating a film. Yeah. And they get a studio, and it, it like, can't help but mention, like, seeing those documentaries, and like, yeah, that's pretty much Ghibli. It's like, yeah, by the seat of your pants. Yeah. yeah. And even the landlord or one of those renter guys, uncanny resemblance to Miyazaki himself. Matter of fact, he has the beard. He has the look. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cute. There, there's a lot of similarity. Yeah. You, well, it's 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 a love letter to the art form that is, you know, animation. Yeah. Yeah. Keep your hands off Izukin. Uh, we reviewed it. Like, wow, I can't believe last it's, year. Last year. Yeah, I can't believe it's been a year. But that <laughs> one, I mean, if you want to know about the process, uh, watch that anime. You'll you'll love it. Yeah. And like I said, that's kind of like our starting point with this sh- our show. And it's coming full circle because we're going back, pretty much going back to our first episode because Ghibli's been the background, pretty much our influences as well. For Edwin, you know, starting off with comics and seeing Warriors of the Wind and then eventually the redub and everything. For me, I was a late bloomer. And around when I was 13 or 14, the first Ghibli film I saw was uh, Spirit Away. And I didn't ever really tie in Ghibli or Spirit Away with anime. And that's kind of a stark difference because I felt like that was more a film, like a story and something that still blows my mind to this day. I remember renting initially, seeing that intro by the creator Pixar, hyping me up. Like, yeah, this is a good, this is probably the best animator out there. And he's been doing it for over 30 or 40 years at that point. I'm like, I don't know this guy. Yeah. But Spirit Away is just a different out of this world experience. It's pretty much my generation, people born later 80s uh that's pretty much their introduction as well good majority wise and the second film i saw was princess Mononaki. now princess Mononaki to this day is still my favorite ghibli film and it's probably in my top 10 safely in my top 10 all-time films oh, wow yeah and it, it changed my life it exactly what i never expected to see in a film until that one and princess Mononaki had its origins too because it without nausicaa there would have been no Prince Monaki. Yeah. Because they so, they share the same story beats from uh, environmentalism to female lead protagonist. And yes, it, the politics as well, kind of like the same story beats. Even the animation is very similar with Omo and the, the Warthogs, kind of like that sludge of like destruction. Well, I, I think both of the films focus on nature uh, kind of defending itself. Yeah. From the incursions of man, very much so. And Monarch is more folklore and more spiritual. It's definitely n- nature. You know, overwhelms you. The n- nature is king. Well, yeah, it talks about the force and power of nature. Yeah, and I, I think that Princess Mononoke is the most Eastern film. Very much, and the most traditional of the bunch. Even I, I more think, so than yeah. even more so than Spirit Away. Like I've talked to a, a few people who, while I didn't find it this way. They found it to be very alien. Yes, it's to, totally, totally removed. to their their very to their to their Western sensibilities. Yeah, um, I didn't feel that way. Uh, I really haven't felt that way about any of the Studio Ghibli movies, uh, and that's one of the things I want to talk about because uh, Miyazaki wanted to make movies for children. 
ultimately. But you know, he would he was so influenced by animation from around the world. Yeah, oh, literally so every corner. Yeah, I feel that the Studio Ghibli movies really work even outside of Japan because they have that grounding in you know like folklore and fairy tale and that's what you feel that's what you get from them yeah you feel this sense of wonder this sense of being of traveling to another world uh like you know alice in wonderland so i think there's reference points where everybody can you know jump into these movies and you know be amazed and impressed and moved yeah very much so yeah and of course the contemporary is disney and disney pretty much being that beacon a bridge towards uh exposure eventually on after spirit away and both are comparable with walt disney and Hiro miyazaki uh miyazaki's more of the earth though i always felt like walt disney is more of the businessman of course well i, I think that in watching miyazaki's process I think Miyazaki's process is much more organic. Extremely. Yeah, it's it's more of an, an organic creative process where you know he's at the lead and it's kind of like gestating yeah for a long time where uh Disney feels more like a kind of like a how do I say this? Like a production process, yeah. In all like the early yeah. days of making a business, like too. An, a, yeah. an assembly line, yeah, yeah. You know, like and you have, you have your writers who are going to write the script, then you have the script, and then you know you have um, the people who break the script down, the people who do the storyboards, the people who are eventually going to do the drawings, and then the people who are going to paint them and yeah, do yeah. the backgrounds. In the, there where are, yeah. with Miyazaki, I feel that. He is the head of every department. I was reading the book as well, and I felt like that because in one of their interviews, the interview was like, okay, what did you do in this production? What did you do in that production? And, and he would be kind of coy, be like, oh, I did the script. But he was mentioning how he would help out with the storyboards and stuff like that. And he'd be like, wait, that's more of the director. Like an interviewer is like stomping is, his... Yeah. No, he's literally doing every department. That's a good... Uh, yeah. He's the director, but he is the head of every department. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because as he... The story's being created through him and by him, and everybody has to wait. Yeah. I mean, they have to wait until he's done with it so that they can move forward. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what Ghibli is. And, you know, we, we have to set it up with this grand scope of things because it's very personal for me and Edwin. And ultimately, like, Edwin being this, you know, one of my best all-time best friends, having that experience where I wish I could grab it. I wish I could see in his, his eyes, his first exposure. <laughs> yeah. Ghibli. And, you know, very intimate with me spirited away because I was like the only boy watching that film. It felt like it, like this tremendous experience and it's a different universe, a different Ghibli universe. So Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is set a thousand years into the future. The world has pretty much been destroyed, not by nuclear war, but by the seven days of destruction. Yeah, by these uh, uh, gods. The giant warriors yeah. uh, created by man. Uh, they essentially set the world ablaze and destroyed the, essentially destroyed the old world. Yeah. Our technologically advanced world came to an end. And uh, the decline of man, you know, began. Drastically, yeah. Uh, and we saw the rise of the toxic jungle uh, and these the ohm that essentially um, have taken over most of the planet. And mankind is restricted to these small kingdoms on the edges of the toxic jungle that continues to grow and grow and grow. And in the midst of this, uh, we meet Nausicaa. Um, she is the princess from the Valley of the Wind, uh, a small community on the edge of civilization near um, the Acid Lake. Yeah. Um, it's, it's referred to as the Acid Lake in the movie. 
it's also referred to as the ocean, the wind, because the wind, um, the wind helps the valley. Um, they have windmills. And it's religious to them too. Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, it's it's kind of like a spiritual connection. Very much so um, for them. And we meet Nausicaa as she's flying above the the toxic jungle, uh, and she enters it and encounters an ohm shell, uh, and removes one of the the glasses from the ohm shell. And it's there that you sense that she's almost communicating. Like she almost has this ability to communicate with the jungle and the ohm itself. Yeah. It like almost like she has this special connection to nature. Similar to Pocahontas, similar to uh, yeah, any type of like kindred towards nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't help but like mention that this is one of my all-time favorite intros because it's such such a simple like thing. Because you see this destruction, you see this dystopian like bleak layout and nausicaa immediately 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 tells you that she's the beacon of hope she's the one that doesn't look at the outer layer stuff but the inner layer stuff yeah she she sees what other people aren't willing to very much so because she takes the time to actually look at it yes and see it for what it is yeah, instead of like because for most of humanity, the toxic jungle is this dangerous, dangerous place yeah. that will that is poisonous. It wipes out towns and toxic, and just it's the spores from the plants just wipe out all other life from the dirty soil. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they wipe out all other life, and no no human civilization can withstand it. Yeah. Uh, whether it be the the spores from the plants, or whether it be the onrush of the ohm, which the the ohm are these gigantic insects that uh, protect the jungle. Kind of like a hybrid of like a maggot with a cockroach, like a, a concoction of like a lot of insects. Well, it, it's like if you know, it, it's very similar to um, what are those ancient. Uh, those really ancient underwater, like you, you see the their fossilized form. Oh, oh kind of like a you helix. You know what I'm talking uh, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking like about? Like a sea urchin, like a sea sea monster kind of thing. Well, yeah, like with the 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 ridges. Yes, to them and yes. The, yeah, it's very it, it it's it's almost like one of those, but that has been irradiated. Yeah, and <laughs> and taken on and, like this giant mutated and form. turned into a very like gnarly clone concoction yeah it's it's very um it, it feels very post-apocalyptic yeah like something like that was birthed in like the fires of nuclear and, winter and very unique too i can't think of like many other futuristic dystopian you know stories no yeah well, this see, is the that, only one that's one of as as yeah. nausicaa is very different than anything out there uh -huh. visually it's stunning like the toxic jungle well the intro has a tapestry yes that tells the story so they 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 cut back and forth between the seven days of destruction and the giant warriors destroying the earth and a tapestry of it yeah pretty much uh alluding to a prophecy uh, like a story you've told within the people yeah well it, it foreshadows something that comes later on yes yes uh that's told by one of the witches and she nausicaa it enters this world uh, she's got her mask to protect her. She's got her glider. And the glider very much speaks to um, Miyazaki's love of aircraft. Uh, re so day one. So. Day yeah. one. And how she flies it, too, is pretty much like what he imagines it to fly like, yeah. ultimately. Very, I mean, it, it's so cool. It's just, I mean, the glider, I fell in love with the glider. Yeah, it's so awesome. Watching it as a child, I'm like, man, she can just take off and fly wherever she wants. That's little, all I want from the future. Just a simple, like, yeah. press a button, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> the gliders would be awesome. Yep, yep. Uh, so it's her willingness to see the toxic jungle. She respects it. Yeah, yeah. She has this, e even though it's so destructive and so like. Well, she has a, she has a respect for the danger of it. Yeah, like, yeah. She's not like this is not this is not her playground. She will explore it, but she has a respect for the dangers of it. Yeah. Uh, and she knows when the jungle is angered. And it's very soon after she discovers 
Well, I want to talk about that beautiful scene where she's laying on the ohm shell. It, that's what I mean. And the spores are just like falling around her like snow. It's like a crystallized like secret treasure box. It feels like. Yeah, it's, it's another world. Yeah, it's a it's a completely different world from the outside world. It's like its own ecosystem. Uh, you all these different animals and like the the bugs and the the, the flying things. Yeah, relatively harmless. Yeah. yeah, for the most part, unless they're they're angered. Yeah, or unless because their job the yeah. is to defend the the jungle. Yeah, as an ecosystem, they're just they're there as acting almost the antibodies of the toxic jungle. Yeah, and protecting it from like incur invasions or uh, infections. Yeah, that the humans are. Yep. Yep. And so Nausicaa, she hears, you know, she knows that something's wrong. Yep. And she can feel it. And it's almost like in the manga, it's a voice in her head. Yep. It's a it's a voice where she starts to communicate with the Ohm. Uh, in the movie, it's more of a sense. You get this idea that she's she senses that something's wrong. There's no li direct line of communication, uh, which I was kind of sad by. Because I feel that it gives her more of a connection to the ohm. That and maybe, like I mentioned, how she's more in, in to, inwards to the world. Like, ironically, she's uh, also in tune with the outer layer, like the destructive side. Something's going to be wrong. I yeah. can feel it. In the, in, the, in the movie, it's more of like just this sense. Yeah. You this know? ominous feeling. Yeah, this ominous feeling that something is wrong. In the manga, it's 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 a more direct like the Ohm are speaking to her. Yeah, and yeah. Th that threw me off too because I feel like the movie had that moments, like especially with the visions and stuff, but it didn't really translate. And it's it's playful, but it is a missing link. Yeah, I I I, I, I just want more Nausicaa. No, no, and that's the thing. Like me and Edwin were, re were reading the manga finally and looking at the art books and the production. Like, yeah, if they only did a part two, because this is like technically the like condensed into one, similar yeah. Akira. So yeah, it, it's a very it's a very um, condensed format for the film. Very much from so. the manga, which is like this huge thing that went on for almost a decade. Yeah, and so Nausicaa is a Nausicaa of the Valley Wind is a very condensed. But she senses that she's there in the toxic jungle. She senses that something's wrong. Yeah. And something is wrong. Um, one of the Ohm has left the jungle and is chasing after someone who has fired on them. Yeah. With a gun. Now, um, uh, Lord Yupa. <laughs> this is our introduction to Lord Yupa. Oh, yeah. Who in the um, the redub is, was voiced by uh, Patrick Stewart. Yes. Which, man. Yeah, and that's a blessing in this, guys. And you saw Star Trek before this then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, when, no, so. I was, I was, I was, that, I, yeah. was I had watched, so I watched the original show yeah. on Sundays. Um, they had it every Sunday they would show reruns of the original. And so I would watch the original. Uh, when I had watched Warriors of the Wind, um, they hadn't even started making um, The Next Generation yet. Yeah. Yeah, but I was a huge Next Generation fan, Star Trek The Next Generation fan. And so when they re de did redo, when they redid the, uh, the edit, uh, with Patrick Stewart, I was very happy yeah. that and, he voiced Lord yeah. Yupa. And we have a side bit because we, I mentioned this in our first episode too. Like our first movie together that we saw was a Ghibli Fest film, Nausicaa of Valley Wind. Wind. It was the first time I saw it too. And Yeah, I dragged you out to that. Yeah, I it said, was a good time. I, I'm like, Jack, we're going to go watch this. Hey, I wanted to see it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, they're showing this. at the, it, was, it, it was a studio Ghibli Fest. This was how many years ago? We're, like right, five years friends. ago? Yeah, and literally yeah. the first film we saw together. Yeah, uh, I said, Jack, they're showing this. Uh, I haven't seen it. I've never seen it. At that point, I had never seen it at the theater. Yeah. So that was my first time seeing it at the theater. Wonderful. That was wow. that was really amazing for me. And yeah, it, it, it held up so well. Uh, I know that compared to modern day animation, it might not look as good. Yeah. But for me, um, I, I think the story... And the artwork, and just I, I think all of it, it, it still holds up to me in oh, my yeah. book. And yeah, we've had commentary like, "Oh, so old fashioned." Of course it is. You have to know a little bit of animation history. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, the styles evolve it, over time. Have. Yes, yes. The the, the styles evolve, 
and you definitely the it definitely looks like something from the eighties. Yeah, but, but back to Patrick Stewart though, it was like one of those scenes where everyone was like rubbing his hands, rubbing his hands, <laughs> because he loves the Patrick Stewart dub. And guess what? It was the original dub. <laughs> and he was like, because the first lines uh, uh, Yupa says is uh, the first lines he says like that opens the film because he's in this desolate town that got wiped by a toxic jungle. He has. A really nice calming introduction. Yet another village is dead. He doesn't make it ominous. He doesn't make it like eerie. He makes it like something's up. And it's a wonderful intro, but we saw the Japanese and everyone was like, ah, <laughs> why? And I'm like, I, I'm I, cool. <laughs> it, what, well, I wanted to watch both. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't do. I, because it, Ghib- of, Ghibli Fest is divided what? into in case showings, either English or uh, Japanese. Because of scheduling conflicts, I had to watch it in the original Japanese, which wasn't a problem no, no. for me. But I liked Patrick Stewart. I liked that. I think they did a, an amazing job with that re-edit on the, uh, the dub. Yeah, yeah. Uh, compared to Warriors of the Wind, because that had been so... <sighs> yeah, I know. Yeah. No, no, with even Nasuka, with the Alison Lohman, she's really good in it yeah and you know if you're not familiar with her she had she had a nice little bump in the early 2000s with magic men white oleander and even uh, uh drag me to hell and she's an underrated actress she she hasn't done anything recently but this is definitely one of her best ones well i think she she manages to capture the emotion uh a lot of the emotions that is yeah. feeling uh a lot of the passion uh a lot of the the, the sadness uh, that Nausicaa feels, but also a lot of the hope. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought she did an amazing job. Yeah, she was very yeah. tender. And, like, uh, I know we're going, like, there's a dense history with the English voice actors. A lot of them are very underrated. I even like James Vanderbeek in Castle in the Sky. Like, people you wouldn't expect to be really good in them. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then uh, Wind Rises of Justin Gordon-Levitt. So, things like that. And then the original voice by Sumi Shimamoto is excellent as well. And both have like a tone where you have this adventure with, with Nasuka. Ultimately, you want to be there for them. You want to help them. Well, you feel like the villagers, uh, you, you have this love for Nasuka. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that they share because she is so, you know, she keeps her promises. Yeah, yeah. She helps the weak. You know, she she's just this overall... Um, She's a hero. Yeah, initially right off the bat. And yeah. that's why I mentioned how uniquely the intro is. And like I said, it starts off really peacefully, relatively peacefully. And, of course, with the big bug, like coming from the jungle, complete 180. And it's a total badass action scene. Well, it, 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 the music. Yeah, that helps uh, too. The, yeah. the, 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 the way the, the scene works, the editing and the scene. And the pacing. The pacing. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's very action packed. Yeah, yeah. Like you're worried about Lord Yupa. It's like, it's going to overrun him. It looks like kill it will. Him? Yeah. Like the red eyes of the, you know, death. The, yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, wow. And she manages to stop it and she manages to calm it down. And she manages to, there's that moment where she's almost like, she feels that she's communicating with it. Yeah, without violence. Without violence, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things about this movie. Nausicaa, there's a transformation in Nausicaa. Um, There's a transformation in Nausicaa. There's almost a transformation in almost everyone where they realize that um, violence and death is not gonna. Violence and death and war is not gonna yes. solve their problems. And it, it had to start from that very first scene. It really did. Yeah. That was the domino effect. Yeah, for her, it's like seeing their rage. Lord Yupa explains that he was trying to rescue what he thought was a human child when it turns out to be, you know, the the, the fox squirrel, the fox squirrel Tito, which oh, the, it it. it <laughs> I had a soft spot in my heart for this movie but that he's a fox squirrel it just reminded me of avatar so much oh, i know because they did all the creature mashups yep, yep. and so it was kind of like a i'm like i wonder if that's where this comes from yeah and pokemon as well the yeah. same color scheme as pikachu you almost feel like were they influenced by it a or, good chance yeah, very good it's chance. a very good chance well, i can't help but mention this this without this film, there have never been Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, you know these epic, epic video games. Like even video game culture, yeah, this is an important film. I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, well, just that that sense of like princesses, yeah, 
and well, that this, prophecy. Yeah. yeah, like even though Nausicaa is a post-apocalyptic film, I think that um, a lot of things kind of it, the the fact that she's a princess from a kingdom, I I think that that stuck with a lot of people. But ironically, she's not of the princess mentality. Well, she is and she isn't because Nausicaa is essentially um, almost a paladin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't say knight because I think the paladin a- adds that kind of like spiritual element. Spiritual, to it. religious. Yeah, and and I don't want to say that she's worshiping any kind of god. Not necessarily. And that's it, a fascinating more, thing. It, it will it, uh, to me. Well, the creatures are named Ohms. Yeah. So. There's definitely kind of like that Eastern kind of like Native American Buddhism. Yeah, I would say Native American kind of like. Well, I was uh, going to say almost Buddhist. That as well, yeah. Nature to it, where it's like she's not really worshiping anybody, but she's also got this connection to nature. Very much so. That I think is very spiritual, and comes across in this film, especially like you said with the tapestries, and the prophecies. Uh, there's definitely where she's there. This very Christ-like um, figure yeah. uh, of a hero savior. Yeah, and the, uh, yeah. it's later explained right, as they get back into the village, kind of like a Lord of the Rings, like welcome back to Gandalf moment. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> Even like Patrick Stewart, he reminds me a lot of Ian McKellen in this film. Oddly enough, I can see that, especially with like his pauses and like his you know roughy kind of like well, delivery in this I role. Think Lord Yupa, I think it's his. Um, very much his character. Yeah. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah, and, and Patrick yeah. Stewart dialed in, and he wasn't like too like Captain Picard. It was definitely Lord Yupa. Yeah. yeah. It was a very different... If you watched his performance in Dune... Yeah, that too. It's Good. very... And, it, and yeah. this film really reminds me of Dune as well. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of similarities to his performance in Dune. Yeah. Yeah. Because Lord Yupa is ultimately like a badass like folklore knight. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. Well, he's the master swordsman. Yeah. Everybody refers to him as that. Yeah. Even in the manga, he's referred to as the master yeah. swordsman. Even the other co- kingdoms, too, revere him. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have Nausicaa. When Nausicaa's returning to the village, yeah. she has this sense of danger. Yeah. It's almost like she has this sixth sense that warns her. Yeah. And there is a, uh, there's a ship that crash lands in the valley. Yeah. And it is carrying a princess uh, from uh, Pajit. Yeah, and this is part of the politics side that this film carefully, carefully introduced to you. Because this, it's even reading the manga and uh, trying to get a grasp of it, it's very hard to like pinpoint. And uh, for, for the, this uh, princess that's in this plane, her name's Lestelle. And it, apparently, this is the part where I get kind of confused because initially... Nasca feels it because of that beginning it explains her kinship with the bugs with the toxic jungle, but not necessarily with other people. So that's a kind of like weird because I don't think it's um, I, because her connection to them is more on this plane, okay, than it is on a, a more spiritual plane, okay. I think uh, is what they were going for, yeah, because there's definitely they can sense that their love for Nausicaa. It stems from who she is, yeah, and how she behaves, and her character. You know, she she pays attention to the children. She keeps her promises to them. Yeah. You know, she no, com- she defends them. Yeah. She fights for she's them. She's a comrade with the, the soldiers yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, she's there. I mean, she's in the thick of it. Yeah. I mean, she might be their princess, but they have more access to her, I think, than and in any other. I mean, it's a small kingdom. Yeah, but at the same time. She doesn't shy away from her connection to them. Yeah, ironically, dives into the other kingdoms as well mm-hmm. because of this plane. This plane, because of the storm, falls down and kills uh, the other princess. Yeah, so there's essentially three kingdoms. Yes, there's uh, Pajit, the kingdom of Toromikia, the kingdom of Toromikia. Yeah, and then the Valley of the Wind. Yeah, so yeah. there's three. The confusion, I think, comes in because they're always saying the warring, like the warring nations. The valley. Yeah. Well, Things, the, words like the that. The warring nations yeah. around the, the valley yeah. when really in the film they only talk about two. Yeah. And the, the ship that crashes is a Tomikian ship, but it's coming from Pajit with precious cargo. Yeah. Uh, one of them being the princess who was captured by them. Nausicaa is able to talk to her. But there's also something else on the ship, which is a terrifying 
uh, is absolutely terrifying to everyone because what has happened is that in the in the graphic novel in the manga you find out that Pajit essentially is a city on top of other cities, ancient cities that have storehouses of different kinds of things. Yeah, wiping out the old cities. Mm -hmm. And so underneath, they discover one of the giant warriors. One of the giant warriors in kind of a proto form, Yep. which is not good news for anybody. Yeah, they're trying to make a clone of it, and it's kind of referenced as, well, kind of like the end-all, be-all weapons, kind of like a nuke. Yeah, it's essentially they found a nuke. Yeah. They found a nuke unhidden, buried beneath their city, and the Tomikian Empire stole it from them. Yeah. And somehow they managed to fly through the jungle, and they, they ended up crashing. Yeah, because of an infestation with yeah. the taxes, with the bugs, essentially. Now, in the manga, it's it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's more detailed. Yeah, um, it's way more detailed. Yeah. Um, it's simplified, I, you know. It's the a movie. Film. The movie shows the princess's face though when she's crashing, which is fascinating. Yeah, they needed to see that resemblance. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. Uh, so crashing down now, the valley here's this you know gigantic creature. Um, what are they going to do with it? Yeah, and before they know it, they're invaded. Yep. Yeah, and then that's where things start to get crazier and more complex ironically more yeah. complex and the simple adventure story definitely has that tone like you know if you look at the bigger picture mm. well the the <laughs> essentially the the valley is invaded yeah the valley is invaded and now they have to they they want to take the creature back but they can't yeah uh so they take the princess instead they take the princess they take a bunch of supplies they take their gunship they take everything they can from the valley and leave the essentially the creature to be gestated there. Yeah. And as they're returning, the princess's brother, the Pajit princess's brother, uh, I believe is Abel. Yeah, yeah. Asbel. Asbel. He's the twin brother. Yeah. So he essentially has been flying around looking for them. Yeah. And he finds them and he lays waste to their fleet. Yeah, he's kind of yeah. like a kind of like a renegade, kind of like yeah. a rebel. Well, he's kind of like a Luke Skywalker kind of character. Almost, but he's more yeah. affiliated with like you know, the, kind of like the bad side of rebelling. Well, the thing is, is that nobody in this thing is innocent. No, nobody's technically innocent. The Valley is definitely neutral. They try to be neutral. They're only there just to be on their own. Yeah, Nausicaa and the Valley are just trying to exist. Yeah, and politically, like, I, like I had to like look up like any type of like resemblance to any type of war. The closest ones I could think of, unfortunately, are like the Korean War and the uh, Vietnam War, where stand standard buys are watching a war essentially. Yeah, yeah, and two bigger political you know forces at play. Yeah, yeah. So it, ultimately, it's one of those things where. Even though this is like its own take, own very very unique type of war, it, I, ironically they're not the they're not they're fighting each other when they're supposed to be helping each other. Well, in in the in the manga, they have treaties, yes, uh, in place that are supposed to safeguard against this kind of thing. Yeah, in the movie, mm, nah, th it's a free for all. It. That's it. Yeah, it's a free for all, and Nausicaa continues to watch people suffer and die yeah. because of this you know friends and you know innocents and just get caught up in this slaughter and you know throughout the film you see her just like no this can't keep going yeah this can't keep happening and so they crash they all crash in the toxic jungle and it's there that she meets asbel and she communicates with him. Well, she, she managed to save his sister from the wreckage. But it's also there that she discovers essentially what the toxic jungle really is. And the toxic jungle essentially are a collection of plants and animals that have evolved to purify the earth soil from the toxins that we put in there. <laughs> the, the, we essentially poisoned the entire, the entire surface of the planet for the most part. And the jungle is working the toxins out of it's purifying. It's actually it's purifying. finding a way to purify it. Yes. Yeah, it's purifying the the water and the soil essentially so that you know nature can can you know go back to the way it was before. And nature does find a way, ironically, with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Not everything though. 
No. What we've done to the planet, I don't think is... <sighs> and that's one of the things that makes me really sad because this movie came out in 1984. And I think its message wasn't heard then. No, and like I mentioned yeah. in our intro as well, Miyazaki didn't officially have a... Like, he didn't officially go to animation school day one as a child prodigy or something. No, he had to grow. He had to see the world. He, he grew up during World War II. A hard reality there, too. And he first got his degrees in uh, environmental studies and uh, politics. Yeah. Real world shit. And eventually, he found a calling with animation because of these studies, ironically, and drawing details of you know nature ultimately and nature is being very 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 keen with Miyazaki. Well, I I think that like I said before, this is one of his most personal films. Extremely personal. Yeah, I think this one. Uh, I'm glad that we chose that we chose Nausicaa and The Wind Rises to talk about because I think those are two of his most personal films. Yeah. Yeah, where he is. This is it's driven by him. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is driven by his passions. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, him in Nausicaa in that um, that kind of conflict. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? It also. Why is this happening? Yeah. And also his background with World War II, like Japan got, yeah. got nuked. And they, uh, those towns are still having radiation problems. Things like that. They're still concerned. They still have uh, ultimately, like, they also. I'm not sure of the regions, but they kind of have like acid rain sometimes, like in smog sometimes. Yeah, these are still concerns today in Japan. And Japan is a small little island. Even they have problems controlling the environment. So it's ultimately one of those things where for early message on with environmental stories, it does millions of years of wonders. Or it, it has it has its own prophecy ultimately how the world's going to be today, kind of, sadly. Yeah, I mean – just watching and I, that's that's a thing it's hard to wake people up but i think that this movie because you don't see a lot of environmental films that handle it this yeah, way compared to like captain planet fern gully yeah oh, or oh. or even like the day after tomorrow yeah even that mostly it gets turned into uh um, yeah. yeah disaster movies yeah. uh a lot of disaster movies and i think this movie takes you know kind of like politics and war and religion it doesn't on a, in, on a more adult level it makes you think more than those can never try yeah, yeah. and well it, it's it's a film it's a film about the dangers of well not only the dangers because i mean at that point it's over yeah but like the dangers of interfering with nature and how we we can yeah. all we can hope to do is live in peace with it and that's what Nausicaa is able to do yeah. uh, toward the end of the film. She's able to reach, you know, she's able to stop the evil of men and balance out their relationship with the Ohm. Yeah. Uh, everybody else is left in all. I mean, they're, they're nobody, their they're tanks, their weapons, nothing. Not even the, the ancient weapons can stand in the way of nature. It reminds me of Star Wars a little bit. Oh, yeah. In that sense where nature is so much more... There's a line that Darth Vader utters, the power of this battle station is nothing compared to the power of the Force. Yeah. And you get that in Nausicaa where it's like the power of the... You know, their tanks and their bullets and their weapons and even the ultimate weapon that you compared, you know, the giant warrior that you compared to a nuke, it couldn't stop them. No. It couldn't stop them. I mean, they're giant irradiated cockroaches. Nah. It's like, no, nuclear, yeah, radiation is not going to stop them. Irony play, too, because, yeah, years and years of that crap, guess what? <laughs> yeah. Nature's going to take over. Yeah, they, they <laughs> built, they live in it. Yep, yep. They live in the poison. They're, you know, cleaning they the They adapted. They adapted to it, and they're cleaning the planet of it. And it just, it watching it, for the watching it for this episode of the podcast just made me really sad because you know like i said it came out in 1984 and you really hadn't seen anything that personal that made such a big influence you yeah. know that that was that popular yeah uh what it, it was for a long time it was one of the highest grossing movies uh of all time in japan yeah 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 and so it, it was like to just know that it's been there for so long and that 
we really haven't done anything with it. That message of hope that Nausicaa left for us way back when, it's really, it's really sad. Yeah. 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 And it, I mentioned this before too in one of our uh, episodes how I considered Nasca like the most depressing. It's definitely, you know, the, the f- footing with Ghibli. Of course, everyone thinks of Tortoro. Everyone thinks of Kiki's Delivery Service. Jolly good films. No, like there's a real element of play too with a lot of Ghibli films. That's why I respect it. That's why I catered towards it. Even Spirit Away has a very dark underlying message too. Yeah. And a lot of things in between that human nature is at conflict. Well, those those movies spend a lot more time being, I don't want to say silly. No, even Torturo uh, has a weird environmental message in there too. It does. Yeah. It does. But they're more playful. In a way, and they find a way. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, they're more playful than Nausicaa is. Nausicaa, it, it feels like the wasteland. Yeah. It feels... Like Dune. Like It kind of reminds me of Dune. It also, in a weird way, reminds me of the Borderland games. Yeah, yeah. There's this very sad, sorrowful kind of music uh, to it, and the environment is very dangerous and deadly to humans yeah uh so both of them have that kind of like man what have we done (laughs) (laughs) what what can we do you know no but like what have we done to the planet you know yeah what have we created we've created this wasteland where nothing can survive and you know here we are here's nature trying to fix the mess that we've created and we're still fighting it I know. every step of the way in and, that movie. And yeah. all these questions are like literally pounding, like stacking up, stacking up, stacking up. And we're not even near the midway point in no. this film. And it, in each scene, I admit, is, or each sequence you get to see in this film, it's straight up. One, two, three, four, five. There's no stopping. No. And I like that. I actually really like that because they don't have like a moment to breathe. It's more like a chase. Akira is very similar in that regard. And because it's so condensed as it is from the manga, it's I appreciate it even more. I thought I would I'd be, like the manga more, but the manga is surprisingly very dense. Well, the manga the manga is a different beast yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, I, I keep thinking that uh, I would want to see uh, like an anime, well, uh, a continuation, per- like a like a, yeah. like yeah. Well, even just like I don't know that the film needs a sequel. Uh, I, I think that it, it's, it closed up perfectly. I would argue. Yeah, I, I think that it stands well on its own. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the essentially everyone's left with the message of like, don't mess with the jungle. <laughs> you know, this it's just don't mess with it. Yeah. This is you know, your Nausicaa's operating on a different plane of existence, and we don't have a hope except to let the jungle do what it needs to do, so that hopefully future generations can have a, a world where they can grow, you know, they can grow without the poisons and the toxins. Yeah. And, you know, the world will be reborn uh, with a new ecosystem and a new everything and the toxic jungle will fade away uh, to the edges of society, you know, to the edges of the world just in case it's needed again one day. Yeah. You know, and that's the sense that you know that afterwards it'll be par- it'll be a paradise. Yeah. It'll be an absolute paradise, but it might be a paradise free from humanity. <laughs> yeah, if they're not careful, if they you know if they don't wipe themselves out in war, if they don't learn the lessons, and I think that that's one of the important things about not only this film, uh, but even later in the Wind Rises, where it's like if we don't learn the lessons, what will be left? What yeah, will be left? For more too, yeah. Yeah, the, the question is like, what will be left if we don't learn the lessons? Will there be anything left? Yeah. Will we be able to do anything about it? Will it be, will we wait till it's too late? Yeah. You know, I think that that's the, some of the messages that you take away from this film. And it's beautiful because as it, it, it's, as, uh, as a film, like I said, that's tremendous because you don't see that. Uh, you don't, you didn't see it. And then, a female protagonist in like the early eighties. It's like another scope of things. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that's a conversation. We could have an entire podcast just about that. You know, this is a sci-fi feature that feature. It's like alien. Yeah. Uh, or aliens. Uh, like you know. So, so like sci-fi films in general, kind of like that afterthought, even Star Trek having that afterthought, like, Oh, we have progressed. Hey, you know, we're talking to this person mm-hmm. who happens to be that. 
move on. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think well, Nausicaa happens to be a princess. Yes, that as well. The, so, tro- the trope is dead, dead in the water. Yeah, yeah. she, you know, she's she's uh, a princess. You would kind of have to be female to be a princess. Uh, but at the same time, she's the hero of this film. Yeah, and she she's has the night as moments. Yeah, she's the knight paladin. She's the Christ hero figure. Yeah, and one of my favorite scenes is uh, when she f- fights uh, the Tamekians in her father's deathbed. We haven't even talked about her. Father oh, that either. was awesome. Yeah, that these emotions awesome. are perfect. It was like yeah. a samurai film, like a Kurosawa film. Yeah, and- yeah, they, they, they. The the planning on that scene was tremendous yeah. because she runs in there and she takes them out, and it's like, man, you guys don't stand a chance. Yeah, and she's good. She's very good. And with the father aspect, that's the one thing I want to mention because you mentioned how she has a sense this is her danger. Part of that like assumption also ties in with her father who's dying of the pores of the sickness. Now that's one of the things where I got a little confused by in this movie me too because the wind is supposed to help keep the valley clear of the spores and the poisons they're pretty much a buffer between them and the toxicity yeah but they're they're feel well the fields that they're growing their crops in are essentially poisoned by man's toxins yeah uh they're not poisoned by the toxins and poisons of, of the, the jung- toxic jungle yeah. they're poisoned by the toxins that man has left there yeah and this split like and that's battle. It, that, yeah. well it's, it's essentially the same toxins that are in the jungle but in the jungle they're more of a purified form because the plants are sucking them from the environment and out into the atmosphere yeah and nasagar herself actually built her own sanctuary her own greenhouse as it were yeah. to ha- harness these type well, of she, plants. that's that's what she that's where she proves that yeah that's another thing that bothered me i'm like this is so far underground. How are these plants growing well, from, without sunlight? Yeah, for me, why didn't she make the antidote sooner? At least try to help our father that way. That's what I'm trying to get at with this. Well, it wasn't an antidote per se. Yeah. She was just growing them without any toxins. Mm. She was using the soil and the water at the bottom of the wells that were free from the toxins that we had left, the pollution that we had left in there. Yeah. Um, And so the plants grew just fine. You know, they grew like regular plants. Uh, The thing with the jungle is, is that as they grow, they take those poisons out of the environment. uh, And that's why the spores are poisonous because it's like they carry, they're carrying all of that toxin. You know, they're pulling the toxins out of the ground, releasing into the atmosphere, purifying the soil and the water underneath it. Yeah, I wish that we had something that could work like that for us. Yeah, uh, imagine. Well, if our, like I mentioned, environments do find a way. We're just making it worse, and that's the ironic part. It's like if we cut down emissions, cut down plastic use, things like that. You'd be amazed what the you know can come from that, and how nature would adapt from that. You have to be super patient. And well, <laughs> I, I think that we had our wake up call. Years and uh, years ago. Years and years ago. Starting in the 70s. I, I and I, I think we, we ignored it because we thought it wouldn't be the problem that it was today. And it, it's a it's a problem now. Yeah. Now there's extreme weather all over the planet. And I don't think we really know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, watching this movie and knowing that it came out in the 80s and that it didn't have more of a, more of a worldwide influence uh it's it's make it makes me sad but yeah. i'm glad that it was made uh it's a beautiful movie um especially towards the, near the ending point because the message is clear clear as day too yeah I, I i there was some creative choices with the outfit changes and this is just like my personal hang up and i remember thinking you're, this, you're getting him out of the way though we're well, talking about like the things were like yeah <laughs> well it was it was me as a kid thinking all right, so what? Because <laughs> in the prophecy, it was a man who was dressed in a blue outfit, and enti- through the entire movie, Nausicaa wears a blue outfit. Yeah, and then she changes to a pink outfit, but then it looks blue again. And I'm like, is this like the Han Solo jacket? Is this like? Well, it, is this like dress gate? Well, the, earlier in the movie, the prophecy is the blue man 
in the robe to save the valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what to save it from. I, I wasn't too clear with that. The Baba, the old lady, mentions that story. Well, it would come and save them from the jungle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. And, and, and she does. She, she, she saves the people from the valley. Threw from her the jungle. Field, threw her field of gold. But in, not in a way, I think, that they expected. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's more like a outer layer vision. And the, only the Baba saw that like golden field vision. She's yeah. blind. She's the blind prophet of the film. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's coy. It's very coy with this folklore. And they, like even the first, second time viewing it, I didn't realize how sacrilegious is that is. Like it was like kind of like an add on, it felt like initially, for me at least. What, the prophecy? No, or? no. Like, like uh, kind of like the story of the prophecy. I thought that was like not going to be too important. Then no. it, it is. Yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> Well, it, it's well. I think the way it works in the film is foreshadowing. Yeah, uh, it works as foreshadowing. The tapestries at the beginning uh, kind of play into the prophecy that we see on the tapestry in the the king's room. Yeah, yeah. And so it kind of like it's there, uh, but it's only really there for her, for the blind prophet. Yeah, because it's. The fulfillment of that for her, um, you know, it, it, and that's where I think it plays more into religion. Yeah, because it's like she has this belief that something will come and save them, and it, it's Nausicaa. Yeah, Nausicaa comes and saves them. Yeah, uh, we don't have a Nausicaa. No, nah. and um, and how she saves they ultimately is kind of a case study. Well, it's it's you know she because she's able to communicate. She's she sacrifices herself. She sacrifices herself in order to right the wrongs that men have done. What they do to that home is terrible. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, what they do, because this is near, near the conflict, I know with the politics pretty much takes over the second half of the film. We haven't even talked about Kushana, the other princess. She's the leader of Toromiki and uh, rebels, if as they were, or the kingdom. She's the foil. I don't like her. Yeah. I, I never did. <laughs> I, I didn't like her when I was a kid. I didn't like her now. Yeah. Uh, she's so wrapped up. She is an interesting character uh, because she's she's also a princess. She's like an adult version of Nausicaa, I would argue. She is an adult version of Nausicaa, but she doesn't have the strength that Nausicaa has. The inner strength. Yeah. The inner strength. The yeah. inner or spiritual strength, that too. you could say. Yeah. Because... Nausicaa has learned to live with the jungle where um, Kushana has fought the jungle every step of the way and it has cost her greatly. Half of that woman's body is prosthetics. Yeah. She even, there's even a line in the movie where she thinks if this, you think, if you think this is something, wait till my future husband see, gets a load of me. That's a cool line though. And it's like, <laughs> ouch. Oh. Shows how badass she is. Well, not only that, but how much she's been scarred by the jungle Yeah, yeah. because she chooses to fight it. And it's like, duh, the whole point is you can't win. Yeah. That, you cannot win against nature. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot win against a hurricane. You cannot win against an earthquake. These are forces that are just too big. To be and they're getting stronger by the fought day. against, yeah, and yeah. yet Kushana has thrown her entire body against it. She has thrown everything that she can in really shitty ways. Yeah, yeah. And it has cost her. Yeah. It has cost her nearly everything. And finally, I think towards the end of the movie, uh, the time that she spends with Nausicaa kind of changes her. Yeah. And I think everybody in the movie those dialogues grows. are the best. I like it yeah. better than her, her exchanges with Lupa. I like it better in exchanges with her, her father because th- those are the ones where well, I think Kushana has more room to grow than the other characters. Yeah, that, yeah. and th- it's the foil. That's your you needs have to have to talk with your antagonist. Yeah, and Nas- they have a playful setup where it's like, oh, you're a princess too. Like we should be civil. Yeah, <laughs> but this is for a war. It's yeah. It's it's like. You're destroying my valley, bitch. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, no, I'm not having We're that. We're doing this Ghibli style. That's right. <laughs> it's a throwdown in the toxic jungle. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. no holds barred. No holds barred. And, and, and then that's what comes to a point because the uh, Turamikians, they are impatient. They want to get rid of this you know, problem today kind of thing. Well, they, they, they think that the old solutions are the best solutions. It's like... 
if we can't, you know, if we can't fight this jungle, let's nuke it. <laughs> but it's like it's a radioactive jungle. It'll make it idiots. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yep, yep. And the, the blind witch, uh, she even says it's like the warrior, the giant warrior fails because it's not ready. It hasn't just dated. And it long made enough. destruction. Ultimately, but I think yeah. that no matter what, it would have failed. It needed to fail because she she has a really good line. It's like the Om know that if we have to depend on something like that, we don't deserve to live. Yeah, and that was a key line. Very. That, key line. I think that's a key line not only for uh, the movie, but a key line for Miyazaki's views and on c- nuclear war. Current, current it's politics. Like, too. Yeah, well, yeah. it's like yeah. if we have to use these things. Do if we have to depend on these things, do we deserve to live? Do we deserve to exist as a society? <laughs> yeah, it was very telling, very interesting. And I think both of these movies are are, are kind of they're anti war movies. Yeah, at the end of the day, yeah, they're anti war movies because I think they saw, and I mean, Kushana is like the perfect illustration of that. Yeah. Of kind of like a, a false knight, uh, America. <laughs> well, the, the the Nausicaa that has kind of the Nausicaa who hasn't accepted that uh, kind of almost that wants to fight ultimately. Yeah. Well, not that, but that almost like Princess Mononoke Nausicaa kind of like in every movie that they do, kind of like this relationship to nature. Yeah, this spiritual balance that we have to maintain. That war just does it. That war completely and totally ignores. Yeah, you know the destruction of it, the the the, the carnage of it. It's like the she, you know, uh, Kushana ignores the, the the balance, and so she lives almost as a false human. Uh, half of her is gone anyway. Yeah, yeah. And this devotion to war turns her more and more into a machine, where she's lacking the ability to even have that connection. To humanity, and I think Nausicaa reminding her, like maybe of herself when she was younger, her ideals, her ideals, and like the strange way that she does things, the 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 way she's willing to sacrifice herself yeah. for others, kind of bring her back. There's a there's a moment in the film she's like, I'd like to talk to her. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, she's like she wants to understand, and I think that she kind of does. Uh, the little. The kind of like I don't know how to describe this guy. Kind of like the stars, her star scream. Oh, um, <laughs> that that's uh that's yeah. that's a uh, Kurokawa. Kurokawa, the he, s- he, savvy servant. <sighs> <laughs> he has some of the, like the most like oh, 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 lines. He's like in a different movie. <laughs> he's the most traditional. I, I would say that he's the most traditional villain in the movie yeah kind of like the lovable villain person. well the, the mustache twirling yeah. <laughs> kind of like yeah like proto he is he rather go for the joke than for the obvious things yeah <laughs> like he's well he says that he says it too that he can see a change in her in uh nasica no kurashana uh he can see a change in her that he says and he says it too he's like this is the most attractive I've ever found. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? That's near the end. And it's because she's changed. And yeah. it's because of her, you know, her exposure to Nausicaa. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's a moment where she, Nausicaa's in the gunship getting ready to escape. And Kurishana's there. And she's gonna... Because the Tarmikians uh, initially kidnap her. Yeah. yeah. We spoke to that. Yeah. Um, and so this moment, you know, Kushana is like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, she's getting ready to jump on her thinking that she'll jump on her, kill her, and take the ship for herself. Yeah. But Nausicaa says, come on. Bring it on. And Kurishana's like, no, she doesn't say, come on, bring it on. Let's fight. Come on, we can escape. We can ah. get out of this burning ship. Yeah, that's true. And I think at that moment, Kurishana's like, what? Okay. <laughs> I was going to kill you and take the ship, but I guess this works too. Yeah, it's now I remember. Yeah. So there's that moment where she's like, all right, she kind of like ducks down while Nausicaa is essentially saving everybody. Yeah. And she's like, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to stop you." But then she's terrified by the bugs in the jungle because, you know, uh, Asbel is fighting them and so they're chasing them. So she's just kind of stunned. Uh she can't move cuz she's terrified. Yeah. She's terrified even though she's been fighting them for her whole well, life. Yeah. She's terrified because the jungle has taken so much from her. Yeah. 
she's absolutely and totally terrified of the jungle. Yeah. I mean, which is why she wants to fucking drop a nuke on it by, you know, in the form by of proxy. a giant warrior. Yeah. 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 And so she's completely in stunned, but Nausicaa takes charge and tells everybody what's to do. And she's, uh, Kushana's really impressed. And because that's Nausicaa. No, and, and the, that's really like the finale because, like we mentioned with uh, the Omen, they, they have to face the Omen. They want to get the rid Omen. of it, the Omen. And what they do is that they start to lure in the bait because they're kind of like, uh, how the ohm, ohm uh, pretty much communicate is through their own wavelengths. If one's in danger, the rest are in danger. So they have to help out their kindreds. So they somehow get this uh, baby uh, ohm. Well, that's the Pajit. The Pajit. The Pajit. The Pajit have essentially destroyed their own. They so destroyed their own kingdom. They destroyed their own kingdom by luring the ohm there to uh, defeat the Tomiki, uh, the Tomikian Empire. And so now they're going to destroy the Valley of the Wind and the warrior by doing the same thing, which is leading the Ohm, enraging the Ohm and leading the Ohm by essentially, and this is just like, uh, yeah, I know. It's, so it's, essentially it they put spears into this Ohm and fly him over to the Valley so that the, uh, the Ohm will get enraged and follow it and destroy everything in their path. In their hopes, destroying the Tomikian and the the warrior, but essentially their their idea of using the Ohm as their own nuclear weapon. <laughs> they're down to like one ship from an empire, they're down to like one shipload of people. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah, it's 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 horrific. And you see it bleeding like that uh, they've done to them. Well they've done yeah. this they did this to their own empire. Yep. And now they're going to do this to the Valley of the Wind. And they've done this to this poor uh, Ohm. And it's insane. Yeah. Uh, and Nausicaa, this is when Nausicaa, like, loses her shit. She's like, no, no more. And she she sacrifices herself to save this baby Ohm. Yeah. To, she gets shot up by the, the Pajit. Uh, she gets shot up by that. Because she was trying to uh, free the, uh, the, the baby Ohm. Mm-hmm. And it's a pretty badass scene too. It's similar to how she defended her father. Yeah, the action sequence is great, but then it gets really horrific because she gets her foot into the acid lake. Yeah. yeah. Well, she comes at the guys like the guy in the little dirigible, uh, kind of like that floating thing that's holding the ohm yeah. up. Uh, the guy is saying, "Shoot her, shoot her!" And she has guy, a similar jump towards like. Well, Lord, yeah, Lord Yupa. She's <laughs> not fighting them. She's yeah. not shooting. He doesn't want to shoot her because here's this unarmed woman coming at them yeah. in this ship. And he's like, well, she's not fighting. And so the dude says, no, 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 no. The violence so, is not it being the answer, quote, unquote. Yeah. She's, you know, non-aggression uh, and pacifism is her last weapon. And she manages to bring it down, but she still has to defend the, the Ohm. And in their rage, the Ohm essentially kill her. And then they bring her back. They bring her back because they see the sacrifice. They see the baby Om being held, like saved by Nausicaa. Yeah, she saved them. She saved the baby. Uh, they they come to their senses. Yeah, they come to their senses. Yeah, from red eyes to blue eyes. Yeah, they come to their senses and they realize what they've done. Yeah. They realize what they've done. They've realized who Nausicaa is and what she's done, and so they lift her. They bring her back and lift her up. And she's almost, it's almost like this elevation to another plane. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the little blind prophecies, the prophecy unfold, even though she's blind, she sees a vision. Uh, <laughs> I, I was reading in the Miyazaki interviews thing, and he basically mentioned, I didn't really want to make her like Joan of Arc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to make her like this religious figure, but in the movie pretty much had to be tied in towards not a bad ending, or I guess say like a realistic ending. But it's a complex. This is a complex in Miyazaki too. See, he does that, and yet, and yet, and yep, yet. Yep, yep. He's still a child. He's still. Well, well, it's not that he's a child. It's that he says that he doesn't want to do something, but that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah, it's a complex. I mean, through throughout the entire film, you get this sense that Nausicaa has a special relationship to the Ohm, and that it's a it's a, it's a more spiritual 
relationship that more so than a typical hero yeah. they're giving her visions yes, yes. Uh, she's having visions uh at first i thought they were flashbacks they're weird the visions really threw me off not well, i thought it was like before i thought it was flashbacks or dreams yeah but then i realized no the Omar are giving her visions yeah like she's get, they're giving her visions and they're the communicating manga, with and, her and then the manga they actually talk to her mm-hmm. yeah and then if you're not going to make it religious why would you call them ohms yes Om. I mean, <laughs> and the and the see, prophecy. He foretold. likes to have it both ways. Yep, yep. He's a little trickster. No, Miyazaki. He's a complex, and he, he fights. His no, own. he's definitely. Con- yeah. Watching the document, watching these movies, and watching the documentaries about him, he is definitely a complicated character. Yeah. He's, a, he's definitely a complicated man. There's a lot going on there. It was very interesting to watch. It, I gained a newfound uh, appreciation. Appreciation and respect. Yeah. But it's also very... I, I, I would just say that he would be a difficult man for me to... You know, he would be a difficult man to work for. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. And we were talking this before we recorded how he, he adores children. He loves it would children. Be, it would be like the honor of my life. Yeah. Because it would be like just to be able to work but at the same time it would be like man this would be tough tough no it would I, be it, tough that's it what would I mean. be the toughest i think it would probably be the toughest thing that a lot of these people ever do yeah but it it would be so worthwhile yeah that's what i mean because he adores children he, he he's like santa claus to him but then when it comes to adults his contemporaries his staff his subordinates different story he's a boss <laughs> well he's He's very demanding. Extremely. He's very demanding. He wants perfection. He wants in his own senses. Yeah. He wants he wants perfection. He wants he's like he's not gonna accept just like he's not gonna accept an effort. Yeah. He's not gonna accept that you made an effort. He wants the ultimate effort. He wants what he wants. He wants that vision and you have to make it happen. Yeah. And if you can't make that happen, he's saucing you to the side. It's like <laughs> you gotta go. You're not. You he's know. Blunt. He's very blunt. Yeah. It, it's 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 very much like his world, and you're just living in it. Yeah. I I really got that impression. But at the same time, it's like you almost kind of want to be there for the ride. Well, that and make the man this sensible. Well, because it's like it is. These films are magical. And that's they're, because they're, start, they're magical yeah, not, and they're they're magical in a way that I think that a Disney Disney films capture that they capture the heart and they're magical and they're, they're based they, on, they become part of like your your memories. Yeah, and they're from folk fairy tales, like generations worth of like storytelling. But I, I think Studio Ghibli movies do this in a very different way like you said organic and, and yeah. also well, there's more it's 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 well the the creative process organic but even though they're based on folklore and fairy tales there's a sense of originality yeah to them I mean, and, certainly. and a sense of you know like cultural significance that could reach beyond just the just the walls of just the board that could reach beyond the borders of just japan yeah. you know into the rest of the world yeah, and like you said he, his influence is the european culture Throughout the world, yeah. Western culture, you name it. Mm-hmm. Throughout the world. And Nausicaa, I, I just want more people to watch this movie and more people to walk away from it wanting to do something to help the environment, to change the world that we live in, uh, to create a new world where there is hope. Because, I mean, this is it, guys. Yeah. This yeah. is this is like one of the st- stories we do have to listen. So I mean, it should be a prerequisite. In this general. is it. I mean, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, college courses about environmentalism. You name it. Just Or even culture course, you know, to find that. Yeah. And I hope that you guys can watch this movie. Uh, it is a little bit dated. The artwork's a little bit dated. Yeah, I was about to say. But yeah. give it a watch. I-, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I know that a lot of, of us love it. Uh, I don't know that you'll walk away with the same love uh, because for me, I watched it at a very formative age and it made such a huge impression, but I hope that you can watch this film and love it as much as I did and walk away with a new appreciation of Studio Ghibli. Uh, Thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and that's for me as well. Kind of like tying in with that, like you with environmental, like you got to see this to make the world a better place for me, like the history of animation and how you mentioned how it's outdated. We went with a friend who met, that was her first comment. She mentioned that, Oh, it's kind of old. Of course it's old, but it's so also it's 1984. And yeah. like we said, there's a mad process and a mad beginning towards Ghibli. And well, we've always talked about how anime is an art form. Yeah. And how it plays off of what's come before. Mm -hmm. And I think that this movie influenced Studio Ghibli movies, I think have always influenced people. But I think the art I think artwork has really evolved over the years. And yeah, anime characters look very, very yeah. different but now. Specifically with Ghibli, yeah. it's more of a sense of its own original style cemented. I, in I its believe place. so. Yeah. Miyazaki's vision. Minasuka is that. Well, even watching like even watching The Wind Rises. I felt that there were similarities to in style. No, they didn't yeah. leave. And yeah. when Wises has CGI thrown in there, just a little bit, it's yeah. midgets. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, the just the artistic style of the way he draws the clothes yeah. and the line work, it was, it was, it felt like, okay, this is, this is him. This is his, like the oversized coats yeah. and like the, the puffiness and the color <laughs> schemes it was like, you know, these movies are separated by like a 20 year gap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 20, 25 year gap. And yet you can still feel like they were created by the same artist. That's what, that's what I'm trying to get at because yeah. it's cement in the style, but also in the case study of like, like we mentioned how Ghibli became its own formation. We're talking about talents that influenced you without even noticing it. So, for starters, the producer Takahata Iseo or Iseo Takahata, uh, he produced it. He kind of pretty much made Miyazaki part Ghibli. And he pretty much cemented the studio itself. Hideki Anno, pretty much met, he even he was a he started off as an animation department in Ghibli. Later on, directed one of the most he worked he worked on Nausicaa. Yeah. He worked on the uh, I believe it was illustrating the the part of the uh, the giant warrior. Yes. When he attacks it, the ohm at the end. And it ties in with Neon Genesis with the Mechas. Yeah, he pretty much <laughs> yeah. starting off point. Well, and just it, those lifelike, those the lifelike Mechas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, we also have Kazuo Ibizawa. He did the Demon Slayer movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and he was also part of Akira. And how we were mentioning how uh, Nasuka is pretty much like Akira, like key members from Akira. Akira were doing this film as well at the same time. And Nasuka came out before Akira. I, I found that out. The manga was finished before the movie for Akira, but Nasuka didn't complete the manga, but they had the movie out. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we also have Kazur Nori Ito, who did the screenplay. He did the screenplay for my all time favorite. If I had picked number one, like the Citizen Kane of anime films, Ghost in the Shell, the movie, he did the screenplay for that. Remarkable. And also Manuro Kanabi, who also did Elf and Light as director in Promised Neverland. Oh, wow. Oh, cow. Uh, Yochi Ichi Kotabe. I think he also worked for Nintendo because he eventually did the key works for Pokemon and Super Mario RPG. Uh, Kitaro Kosaka, he, he's another key animator. He eventually did Wind Rises. And this is the Fist of the North Star uh, and mobile Gunsu Gundam connection, um, Mitsuki Nakamura. Who also did, yeah, he, he, we're talking about some of the greatest all time animes in the same roof at the same time doing yeah. this one project. I can't stress that enough. That's super important. And uh, I also have to mention before I forget the music. The music, this is the starting point of music, similar to Steven Spielberg and John Williams, uh, the partnership that never ended. We're talking about uh, Haru Miyazaki and Joe Hisha, Hisa Ichi. I think he did uh, uh, Takahata's productions as well. I have to double check that. But ultimately, most of his resume is G uh, Ghibli films and with Miyazaki. And I love this uh, soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my top three. I think it's number, like close to number two, number one. Well, it manages to run the gambit of like really sad and really sorrowful. Too weird. <laughs> yeah, music. Uh, well, it uses some elements from like that are definitely feel like they're from the 80s. Yeah, for the prog, prog aspects of it, yeah. But they also have these the action scenes. Yeah. Like without that music, I mean, just that level of, 
it builds that level of excitement, yeah. uh, especially in that first scene with the ohm. Yeah. Without that music, it would have been a totally different scene. Yeah. And yeah. the first uh, actual live ohm that Nasca scenes that that ooh, like like you mentioned ohm oh yeah. it translates. And then uh, one of my favorite scenes is the when they're in the cave with uh, Nasca and Isabella are in the cave. They have an escape scene. <laughs> it immediately reminded me of a uh, heavy metal. Oh, I can see. Yeah, that. especially with the yeah, <laughs> some synth music yeah. dropping in there, and yeah. it's a contemporary. I would consider that one a contemporary. Yeah, well, it was. I that music kind of reminded me of a lot of like cartoons that yeah, I watched too. In, like in there was uh, GI Joe, yeah. Transformers, and, yeah. and we should mention those cartoons because it definitely has that feel of it from like Transformers, Robotech, you name it. Well, I, I love that the story here is more coherent. Yeah, than and any one of those. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, if I had to pick my my favorite, 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 favorite like moment with the music is the beginning, right? As the show us the title screen, and the do 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 do, do. it has a beautiful like religious overtone to uh, adventure. Do, do, yeah. do. Ah, I love it! I love it! I love it! And also, once again, with the voice actors, uh, the English dub is f- f- fantastic, phenomenal. We, yeah. yeah, we have Patrick Stewart, of course. We, have, we mentioned Allison Lohman as uh, Nasica, Umar Thurman as Kushana, which is, she did a okay. And this is my first time, like doing this re- uh, for the review. I finally saw the English dub, and it was great. Uh, <laughs> for Mito, we have Edward James Almos. <laughs> I recognized his voice yeah, right away. No, I originally thought it was Mark Hamill because I saw him in the credits. I'm like, oh, I think that's Mark Hamill. It sounds like Joker. No, he Hamill. plays. He the, plays the mayor. Yeah, he plays the. Is it the mayor or the king of uh, Pajit? I think it's mayor. Pajit mayor. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, he, it, I thought he had like a bigger part, but it's small little instance. It's a small part. But it's yeah. the same universe as Dune, Blade Runner, <laughs> Star <laughs> Trek, and Star Wars. <laughs> Imagine that. Mark Hamill gets around, man. Yeah, and well, he eventually did uh, Castle in the Sky yeah. as the villain. So yeah, he he definitely has a good track record, Ghibli. But ultimately, you know, I can't recommend this film enough. Uh, we had to really, really make this one a special one. It's yeah. endearing. It's the first ever Ghibli review we did. I know it, uh, it's. I can't recommend it enough. Um, like I said, it it it's one of the it's one of the first movies. I was watching and reading comics and watching movies and watching cartoons and all of this stuff. And this is one of the first things that inspired me to actually put pencil to paper, not just to draw like a figure or a poster or anything, but to actually do my own storytelling. Yeah. That's how powerful of of an effect it had on my psyche where I was inspired to create on a level that I had never been before. And I hope that when you guys are watching this, if you decide to watch it, please do, that it moves you to that level that it did me, where you want to tell your own stories in whatever medium or art form. And I hope that the podcast helps you to do that too. Yeah, at least we we try to tackle this piece. It's a complex piece. Yeah, where you, you know, you guys are moved by these shows and these movies to create in whatever way that you want to create, whether it be a podcast yourself or whether it be art or music or poetry, you name it in whatever way, you know, express yourself, find those things that help you to express yourself and that ignite that passion within you the way that this movie did for me. Yeah. Uh, And I think that that's the legacy, the real legacy of studio Ghibli and all the things that they created it's that fire that they ignite in your imagination and that you should never give up that not that you know you shouldn't follow that you should follow your dreams until they destroy you but that they should always that imagination that spark that passion no matter what find ways to express that in your life throughout your life and i think that that will help not only to make life more enjoyable but to make it uh to give you that childlike magic throughout your life that i think that um miyazaki was able to hold on to where so many of us you know weren't able to that was excellent Edwin. and that's a good way to close it thank you sir yeah no worries 
and I'm back like I never left. Usually Jack is the one that does the editor's notes before and after the episodes, but I'm hijacking this one without them knowing. This is a YouTube exclusive. As you all know, if you listen to the after hour specials, whenever I'm involved, things tend to go left. I'm going to celebrate the two people that's made all of this possible, Jack and Edwin. As mentioned before, we all worked together at a bookstore for years. The pandemic stopped us from working together, but it hasn't stopped the bond that we've established. Only so much can be said over an Instagram DM, so on the rare occasion when we were able to meet once the pandemic restrictions were lift, we picked up right where we left off. Jack went to school for audio engineering, and I thought a good way for him to practice what he's learned was to do a podcast. At the same time, without me even knowing, Edwin's been tossing around the idea of getting into the cod the podcast space to discuss anime and as things have always been with us it came together organically I'm proud that they stuck through with it they've invested the time the money and the sweat equity to see this journey through for a year things continue to grow I thank them for bringing me along the journey thank you Jack for all that you've invested in the hardware and the work that you do editing the podcast and running the social media pages Everybody that listens to the podcast talks about how well it sounds, how good the audio is, and that is a testament to the work that you do. I know juggling life and work and everything is difficult, but you still find a way to push through and get this stuff edited and up consistently, and we thank you for that. You've been searching for a while. But I think you found a lane that you can pursue that will bring a lot of fulfillment in your life. Thank you, Edwin, for the art that you work hard on and contribute to each and every episode. In case you all didn't know, to go a little behind the scenes, if you follow our Instagram page, um, you'll, you'll see and you'll know that each cover art that we have for every episode is drawn by Edwin himself. So, um, we come out with stuff every two weeks, every two weeks, that's a new drawing, new original artwork that Edwin is coming up with, and, um, I know for him it was a challenge, but it's a challenge that he has embraced, and he has, um, done a lot for us to do that, so we thank you, Edwin, for the art that you do. Um, with the exception of a couple contributions from Jack, Edwin is taking care of every one of them. Edwin, you're the heart and soul of the show. Your love and passion for anime, manga, Star Wars, and everything alike come through each episode and every time you speak. I've personally watched your journey through art for the better part of a decade now, and I'm so happy to see how much you've improved and and that you're sticking with it because i know that you've had times where you you haven't put as much into it but the great thing is this podcasting thing has opened up this art lane for you to stick with it and i'm telling you man soon enough you'll be selling books of your art at these conventions you will have a booth one day thank you to the graphic design graphic design extraordinaire Dan for our lifelong friendship and for the logo that you've designed. We love it. It's been a hit to everybody that's seen it and given feedback on it. I thank you. I wish you all the continued success. Marvel is better than DC. A special shout out to Martin, who's a friend and previous guest on the show, who we who we would love to have on again someday. And if you guys have time, check him out on another podcast that he contributes to called The Lab. You'll enjoy it. I personally want to send a special shout out to Dejanay, Jacob, Alberto, Lawrence, uh, Jesse, lifelong friend of mine, the, the, the Isekai man, anime extraordinaire, uh, Kyle. Dave, my wrestling buddy, uh, we, we're, we're definitely going to have to get you on sometime, 
and all the other friends that's contributed, uh, giving me recommendations, giving us a listen. Um, we definitely want to have you all on future episodes once we get the scheduling straightened out. Um, special shout out to Rayshawn Gadsden of the Rayshawn Gadsden Anime Podcast, or our Gap for short. That's available wherever you listen to podcasts. He's one of our first likes on Instagram. Um, and he's always been a guy that's been open and willing to collaborate with anybody that's in the podcasting anime space. Uh, definitely appreciate your support. Brother will definitely be linking up soon. Contact me whenever. Please check out the links in the description for the show. Give Jack a follow. If you'd love the sound of the show, give him some business. Contact him. Say you need something edited. He'll get it done for you. If you like the art on the show, contact Edwin. Get a commission. He'll get something for you. If you love the logo, contact Dan, man. Help expand your business. That logo will take you far, man. He's got a portfolio, and, and he'll get you right. Stay tuned with us as we continue to bring you more content, more grit, more guests. And start to integrate uh, new things into the show. Live recordings, Twitch, all that stuff. And who knows, man, maybe you'll see us on a panel at a convention someday. We're working on it. Be sure to check us out every other week as we continue to bring you more anime audio for Season 2. Thank you for sharing your time with us and tuning in. We couldn't do this without you. Here's to the guys. Here's to you all for Season 2. And this one's for you, Christina. One.